Welcome to Things You Don't Know. It has been suggested that we do some shorter podcasts with some focus on topics more people know something about. Now, we are grateful for the feedback, truly. Uh, this idea has sparked an interest for us. We will continue to pursue uncovering issues of historic importance as we have been. We are delighted to delve into the suggested topic type. In this episode, we will look at the relationship between humans and other animals, especially the more typical animals we call pets. I thought this episode would be easy and short. Fat chance. The problem is that we insist on doing some basic research whenever we take on a project and usually uncover a lot of information. This topic is no exception. Research, in my opinion, is fundamental, and I am bothered when I see a lot of podcasts that do not base what is being said on reliable data. So yes, we do get involved in some of those things, but this should be a fun, a really fun uh podcast episode i absolutely agree dr weaver it, it's something dear to my heart also and i'm very pleased that we're going to be joined for this episode we're delighted to be joined by our our dear friend miss buddy Tannehill, whose educational background is in veterinary science welcome miss Tannehill. thank you so much for being with us today Thanks. It's a pleasure to join you in discussing a topic that's near and dear to my heart. The connection between humans and other animals, listen carefully here, goes back at least 30,000 years. Okay. How do we know? Well, when Paleolithic humans, you know, cave people, made drawings on cave walls, guess what? The drawings were primarily of animals. They weren't of humans or humanoids. They were of animals. Well, between 13,000 and 2,500 BC, humans domesticated dogs, cats, cattle, goats, horses, and sheep from their wild counterparts. Although the terms taming and domestication are often used interchangeably, they are not the same. Individual wild animals can be tamed to behave docilely around humans. By contrast, domestication is a process that takes place with an entire animal species over many generations. Domesticated animals are not just tamer than their wild ancestors, they are different genetically. Over the ages, desirable qualities such as size and disposition were ingrained by breeding only those animals that displayed them. This explains some of the di physical differences between wild and domesticated animals. For example, most domesticated species are smaller, fatter, and have smaller teeth and brains than their wild ancestors. <laughs> You know, the dog is thought to have been the first animal to be domesticated by humans, probably sometime around 13,000 to 10,000 BC. And this happened from their wolf-like ancestors, Canis lupus, to be exact and scientific, you know. Um, scientists believe that humans either adopted cubs wolf cubs and raised them or just began to accept them into their groups and, and to accept some of the less fierce wolves that hung around their camps, scrounging for leftovers. Uh, in either event, humans soon found dogs to be a welcome addition. The arrangement benefited both sides as domesticated wolves helped humans with hunting and guarding duties, and they shared the food that was obtained. Now, although cat remains have been found in settlements that date back to 8,000 BC or so, 
It is not clear if these were domesticated cats, which personally I think they were not. They were tamed cats, as uh, Ms. Tannehill po pointed out, domestication and uh, tame are different. These cats, or small wild cats, they were tolerated or encouraged to live near the people living there. Cat bones mixed with human and rat bones found on the island of Cyprus date back to around 5000 BC. Now, we know that wild cats are not native to Cyprus. Therefore, the cats must have been transported there by humans on purpose, probably to control the rat population, thus saving whatever stored food there was from being infected by the rats. That makes sense. The ancient Egyptians are usually credited with domesticating wildcats, Felis Silvestris Libica in the scientific phrase, originating in Africa and southwestern Asia around 4000 BC. The Egyptians most likely raised cats from kittens to protect their grain stores from rats and mice. Cat domestication is strongly associated with the establishment of permanent settlements, as well as the growing and storage of grains. Cats became important to agricultural societies, just as dogs have been important to hunting cultures. I can testify from my own experience that's still true in Egypt today. My sister Kelly went over there, and there are cats everywhere. They even guard the, the mosques and churches and keep uh, rats out, and they are fed in return by the clergy. The domestication of livestock, chiefly pigs, cows, sheep, horses, and goats, is thought to have occurred between 9,000 and 5,000 BC as agriculture replaced hunter-gathering societies and became more of a factor in the human societies scattered across Asia as well as Europe. Now, history shows that most suitable animals for domestication and use by humans naturally live in groups with a hierarchical social structure. This allows humans to assume a dominant role in the hierarchy and control the animal's behavior. Of the animals that have been domesticated, only cats and ferrets are considered to exhibit solitary lifestyles rather than herd group behavior. Scientists are not convinced that all species of cats and ferrets are entirely domesticated in the classic sense. The ability to keep and control groups of meat supplying animals allowed humans to give up their previously nomadic lives and produce excess food. This freed people to build cities and roads, invent new things and cultivate the arts. According to Bayer, a life science company, the human-animal bond has evolved for over 15,000 years and began as a working relationship. Animals provided protection and service to people. This could have been while hunting, farming, or performing other tasks necessary for day-to-day -day life. Dogs would track and herd. That's the case in Australia to this very day. Cats usually lived outside and would hunt and kill rodents that otherwise could spread disease or damage food or other vital materials. Animals also served people in wartime. The United States Army Medical Department Journal, AMDJ, mentions cavalry horses, sentry dogs, carrier pigeons, and even mascots as common historical roles for animals. According to AMDJ, these animals not only provided protection, but they could offer stress relief and a sense of pride to their human counterparts. It's easy to overlook the human-animal bond as a one-way street. Pets need their owners to meet their basic needs of food, water, shelter, and welfare but humans can gain a different kind of well-being from their companion animals. Research shows that pets can lower blood pressure, reduce stress, raise blood oxytocin levels, and in 
many cases may reduce pain. According to Bayer, people living with dogs or some cats are 15% less likely to die from heart disease. My personal experience has been that animals can really help you calm down if you're upset or having trouble getting to sleep. I often rub my uh, cat's back every night and give him a full body massage as we fall off to sleep. <laughs> that That's so beautiful and beneficial to both of you. Definitely. Pets can offer other benefits for other human health challenges. The elderly and people with some exceptionalities respond well to companion animals. According to Bear, diseases like depression, coronary conditions, and even dementia can be exacerbated by loneliness. By interacting with companion animals, elderly people can experience positive mental and physical effects. Similar results can occur in children during emotional, cognitive, social, and behavioral development. I, I'd like to speak about that briefly. Um, we have a black Burmese cat here by the name of Isis, and we joke that she's our unofficial therapist around here. That cat has an almost uncanny ability to read people's moods, cheer them up, and when we are happy and something positive is going on, she joins in the celebration. It, it's, I wouldn't believe it if I hadn't seen it. Well, that's really cool. I, I'd like to interject here, if I may, that I, I used to have a service dog. Her name was Chelsea Bear. And she read my moods like she was reading a map. And she could follow what was happening with me. And if I was afraid or in need of some uh, support, she was always there to give it to me. And I miss her so very much. Well, I believe she's watching over you still. I'd like to think that. <laughs> the human animal bond can be observed in a whole bunch of different settings. Working animals, especially, are known for their relationships with their human handlers. Emotional support, therapy, and service animals, as you mentioned with Chelsea, provide comfort, offer security, and perform daily tasks to help their owners through life. Animals can be an important part of the healing process for people who experience abuse or trauma, including veterans uh, who have served during wartime and may have PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which can be severely uh, debilitating. Animals can provide other services too. Some farmers station peacocks to watch over their land and livestock. Now, a little funny story. When my mother moved down to Florida, I hadn't been there because I was in school. And I went down to uh, see her. I drive down the road where the house was, and I hear these screams that sounded like um, a woman being hurt. And I'm like, what the heck? And in just a minute, here, my mother comes out the, out the door, and I said, what is that screaming? Who's being hurt? And she says, oh, no, that's just the peacocks. And I go, what? And she said, yeah. And she said, hold on just a minute and I'll show you. And she had this little can of feed that she kind of shook and made a little metal noise like you do sometimes when you're feeding a cat or something. And here comes these um, four peacocks. And they look at me and peacocks are not the most brilliant animals, but they're very, very, very good at alerting and, and whatnot they saw that she accepted me that they had food uh and and they were cool with that but these peacocks were i mean they were like amazing uh, guard animals <laughs> it was truly amazing anyhow law enforcement depends on canines dogs to track and capture suspects identify bombs and narcotics 
And in wartime, you often find um, soldiers adopting a, uh, a dog or cat sometimes, but m mainly dogs, and, and sort of adopting them as a mascot. That happened a great deal in Vietnam. For example, there's a lot of pictures. You can see them if you look it up online. Other things, the U.S. Navy's combat dolphins, combat dolphins, groove on that for a second. They detect underwater mines and the presence of enemy swimmers. The Marines have used mules in a variety of missions by transporting weapons, ammunition, and other supplies through difficult terrains, even to this day. So let's, let's go with a little bit more specific, uh, personal, um, and focus on specific animal groups and some specific animals. Dolphins are one of the most intelligent species on the planet. They're highly capable of both learning and mimicry. Dolphins in different pods actually use mud to create traps and use sponges for protection against coral as they search for food, demonstrating their ability to use tools and manipulate their surroundings. Dolphin pods are even known to alter their hunting location and the timing of it to adapt to or avoid new human activities like construction. You know, I used to scuba dive a lot. Unfortunately, don't have that activity in, on my calendar anymore. But um, many times I uh, would run into dolphins in different spots and they could tell if you were friendly or not to a large extent. And one incident that I do remember very clearly, if you're a scuba diver and you see a barracuda, they have these huge teeth and they growl like a dog and they can be quite threatening. Now, if... Um, if you had made friends, if you were diving in a specific spot and the dolphins knew you, they would help chase away the barracuda so that you wouldn't get bitten. <laughs> Just an interesting little aside. Look at another animal, ravens. Now, they are extremely intelligent birds. And in part, because of it, they are associated with almonds in many cultures. You know, like... A, Poe made him very famous with the raven. You know, that poem, Once Upon a Midnight Dreary, While I Pondered Weak and Weary, etc., etc. Ravens may have better planning skills than human toddlers. One study revealed that they could select a key from a whole bunch of keys and from an array of objects that could be used to open a special box with a treat inside. Now, they could find the correct key 90% of the time. Not only could they find the key, but they could patiently wait 17 hours for the opportunity to use it to get a treat. Now, you get a toddler, and they might be able to select the key but not to a 90% level, at least not until they're probably, you know, four or five years old. But even at that age, they're not going to wait 17 hours for the opportunity to use it. Phenomenally intelligent birds like crows are well known for their love of shiny objects, but their talents do not end with the collection of uh, pretty knickknacks. They are capable of forming a uh, higher thought. Previously, they thought that that belonged so solely to humans and a select few other animals. By looking in depth at their neuroanatomy, sorry folks, I have, you know, I have to bring science into it. Recent research suggests that crows are aware of the knowledge that they have. Okay, that's really different. They are aware that they know something. And they are able to think about that knowledge. Uh, this ability is how individuals, individual crows make new discoveries and humans, that's also how they make new discoveries. Crows and ravens have an estimated vocabulary of 250 words. 
and apparently understand at least 50 to 100 human words. I've had some contact with crows, feeding them, and yes, talking to them. Yes, yes, I talk to the birds and have been rewarded by them uh, for bringing me all sorts of trinkets. There's a flock of crows. In fact, there are actually two two flocks that live right near here. And I was feeding the, the crows. And I noticed after a while that they would be like following me around some. And then I started noticing that little little things would show up. Um, on a, I have a little uh, outside light and they built a kind of nest, a little thing, whatever. They, it wasn't for nesting purposes. It was so that they could come and get food. They decided that's where they wanted to be fed instead of where I was feeding them. And they would get the food, but then they would also leave me little gifts. Well, one time they, they left a little ring in there. Don't know where they got it from, but they got it. And, and other little things like that. It was fascinating. Anyhow, wolves are one of the most intelligent species on the planet. They have very strong family loyalty, in many cases stronger than humans. They continue to foster and teach their young well into adulthood. They are also among the most adaptive species in many ways, more so than humans. For example, wolves can live in the Arctic. In the Arctic, they don't, they, they don't have clothes to wear, people. Um, they find a way to stay alive, and they find a way to adapt. They, yeah, they, they, they're quite amazing. I wonder, do you wonder why I mentioned crows and ravens and wolves in the sequence? Well, <laughs> these three species are connected in a way. Now, ravens and crows, they look very similar. Ravens are a little larger, and they like it. They're more scraggly. But ravens and crows don't like each other. <laughs> they don't get along at all. Crows and ravens have many behaviors in common. Both of these bird species, especially crows, have an almost symbiotic relationship with wolves. A flock of uh, crows... And for some reason, the name for a flock of crows is called a murder, M-U-R-D-E-R, -E murder, don't know why, have been known to almost adopt a wolf cub. They'll play with the cub, they'll follow the cub into adulthood, and they kind of hang out with them. And you would think a wolf would eat bird, right? No, they don't. They, they play with the bird. <laughs> it's weird. Um, crows and ravens alert wolves when there is danger or the, the suspicion of danger. They help track prey. And the wolves, when they kill prey, they'll yip yip for um, the crows if they're not right there. And then they'll share the food with them. They eat at the same time right there on the ground together. It's really really strange. I could go on because it's a fascinating topic for me, but we do want to cover some more animals. Yeah, like chimpan chimpanzees and bonobos. They're very smart. Bonobos have often been called the hippies of the primate world because they are very friendly and like to share with others, including humans. Chimps and bonobos are able to recognize themselves in videos. Imagine that, something humans are generally not able to do until they are five years old. As we said before, dolphins are one of the most intelligent species on the planet. They are highly capable of both learning and mimicry. In the different pods, they use mud to create traps and use sponges for protection against coral as they search for food demonstrating their ability to use tools and manipulate their surroundings. I wonder, would that be an example of pre-operational thinking? Yeah, and, and not just pre-operational, Dr. Deneen. We're, we're really talking about more advanced than that. In, in some ways, 
uh, some of the things that dolphins do is a formal operational thought. It's quite fascinating. Hmm. Well, yes. I mean, that that just bowls me over. That's almost human level intelligence. Well, it is human level intelligence. It's amazing. As we said, to alter the timing of their hunts and their hunting location to adapt and avoid human activities, that's the kind of foresight that almost no other creature would have. That is formal operational Amazing. thought. That's truly fascinating. Well, pigs are a classic example of an animal that surprises many of the people with their intelligence. Pigs are so smart, they can play a simple video game, as proven by four pigs at Purdue University's Center for Animal Welfare Research. The game consists of using a joystick to manipulate a dot that hits a wall. After hitting the wall, the pigs receive a treat. Mm. All four pigs displayed skill far greater than would be expected by random chance. In order to play the game, the pigs had to understand that moving the joystick resulted in movement on the screen. Pigs also have good hygiene. They keep food and excrement in separate places. They have a reputation for being dirty because they roll in the mud, but they do this to keep cool and prevent sunburns. When they have a place to get out of the sun, they do not roll in mud. Now, while I was in training, I had an incident with a um, rather large boar and I was supposed to extract semen from the animal to use in the breeding program that we had going on down at VPI, an SU, Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, my alma mater. And um, <laughs> my job, as I said, was to extract semen from the boars. And I got into the pen with the, the boar and brought him on into where we had a, a thing that he would mount and then um, you would collect the semen. And he wasn't in a real good mood that day. So he got off of the, <laughs> the mounting object and turned towards me and it wasn't running or anything, but he just came towards me. So I backed up a little bit. And next thing I knew, he was pushing me towards a six foot fence. And I thought, oh my God, is he gonna put me through the fence? No he decided to throw me over the fence oh, no. and you know i'm not a little tiny person you know i weighed 140 pounds and he just lifted me up like i was nothing and threw me over the fence fortunately i wasn't hurt i got up i went back got him in and did the extracting of semen but it was a rather interesting experience for me i can well imagine did you when you when you were there, did you have uh, the opportunity to go near uh, Smithfield? No. Yeah, I know. I'd love to eat that ham. <laughs> uh, well, all right. If you if you ever get a chance to go in that area, some of the individual farmers, especially the ones who raise what they call uh, peanut uh, mm. swine, they have little, um, you've seen those little spray things that they use for athletes at, at uh, yes. events? where you, it has a little spray of water and stuff coming through. Well, the pigs on those those peanut farms in particular all have uh, that little uh, piece of equipment, and they don't get dirty at all. They'll get, when they get hot, or they want to get out of the sun, they'll go into that little thing, and they'll, like, take a bath, mm -hmm. in, in essence, and stay cool. And it, and, you know, you're amazed because they look, I mean, they're just perfectly clean. They're, they're not wallowing around in the mud. They don't want to. Right. It's so fasc fascinating. Elephants are one of the most intelligent animals with an amazingly long memory. African gray parrots are another very intelligent species, rivaling apes and outperforming five-year-old humans in deductive reasoning, especially in the area of cause and effect reasoning. And octopuses are skilled escape artists, with some even escaping their enclosures and swimming all the way back to the wild. I can hardly believe it. But 
their jailbreaking is less surprising in light of the fact they have a larger brain to body ratio than any other known invertebrate species. Octopuses are adept at using tools sourced from their surroundings. Some species are even known to carry the tentacles of the deadly jellyfish Portuguese man of war as a weapon, while others collect and carry coconut shells to build shelters for themselves, remind me to never get an octopus mad at me. <laughs> In, indeed, you don't, you don't want to do that. <laughs> and another experiment, pigeons, pigeons, okay? They were trained to differentiate between Picasso and Monet paintings. Mm. Now, there is a ton of humans that cannot do that. The pigeons had no trouble learning that. They were then able to apply what they learned to distinguish between works they had not previously been shown, telling the difference between other expressionists and cubist artists. I mean, okay, folks, that is something many adult humans cannot do with any kind of acumen. Now, wanted to mention a fascinating thing, which I don't think a lot of people know. There was this behaviorist uh, psychologist called B.F. Skinner. And during the World War II, bomber planes would, would be able to blow up ships by dropping a bomb on them. The problem is the target was pretty small, uh, relatively. And in order to be accurate in the bombing, they had to fly very low. And if they did that, they had a, a, a very significant possibility of being blown out of the sky. So Skinner, he says, I know a way to do this uh, that won't involve that. So what he did is he trained pigeons to be the guidance for bombs. They would, the pigeons would, ride in the uh, nose of a bomb that could be dropped from a very significant altitude out of range of the artillery on the ships and could guide it directly into the ship. And it was deadly accurate. Kind of not so nice for the pigeons because they were blown to smithereens because they were in the bomb. But nonetheless, it was a fascinating thing. Now, the, the, the program was discontinued for a while and then recontinued it was discontinued because they thought that they could uh, get electronic guidance systems uh, ready and etc but it was not as accurate as the pigeons when they advanced the ability to make those electronic guidance systems of course the pigeon thing was done but i thought that was a fascinating thing Dogs, cats, and horses are known for being intelligent animals. The intelligence of dogs is heavily impacted by breed and training. With border collies usually scoring highest, dogs generally understand 20 to 45 words and have a memory span of five to seven years on average. Dogs have undergone significant genetic change from their long association with humans. Now cats, they hide their intelligence unless they see something to be gained. They have about a 10 year memory span, understand 20 to 80 words. They also have demonstrated to use a special keyboard showing a working vocabulary of 40 to 60 words. So next time your cat seems to not understand what you were saying, be aware that they may be pulling you. You know, that particular study that you're mm -hmm. referencing there, Ms. Tannehill, is fascinating. Uh, if you ever saw that apparatus, I don't know. I know you, you know, did some uh, observational and, and work at um, uh, the, the veterinary school in, in Alabama, the, probably the best mm -hmm. in the country. This huge keyboard, like, what's that movie, Dr. Deneen, where the... the men were jumping on a keyboard that was big oh you know the one yeah she you're right with tom hanks yeah yes yes exactly okay well it kind of looks like that in a way not quite that big but, but rather large but the cats 
could actually communicate very effectively that way. Now, I have to say this, I have a cat, <laughs> Chloe is her name, and not only does she communicate very effectively when she chooses to, telling me with her meow if she wants food, if she wants to be petted, if she wants to be played with, you know, uh, her favorite toy is the dumbest thing on earth. I think it's, it's a string. <laughs> I mean, I, she has, she has, she has other toys, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> no, she wants to play string with, with me or fetch. And she is a Bombay cat. So, you know, she has a lot of dog like characteristics to her and which is kind of fascinating too. But she also uh, has another thing, which is, is, is strange. And some dogs do this too with their uh, owners if they're close mm -hmm. enough to them. She knows if my blood sugar is um, out of whack and she will pitch a fit, screaming at me, pushing at me, um, palpating, you know, how they need you with their feet and uh, carrying on until I say, okay, I'll check it. And, uh, yeah, she's been right almost all the time. It's quite fascinating. To it me. really is. And uh, my dog, Chelsea, also helped monitor my blood sugar. And it was always amazing to me how right she was. But now horses, my most favorite animal, are the most intelligent animals. They also seem to be very good judges of character. In a study, horses were able to pre predict which convicts were most likely to commit further crimes up to 90% accuracy. You're talking about programs where they have uh, prisoners uh, go out and take care of horses and kind of get to know them. That, that's a study exactly. you're talking about, right? And yeah, I, I, I read that study uh, and it, it's fascinating because to those prisoners that they that are likely to commit further crimes, but they really don't want to have anything to do with them either. It's it's really really interesting. And go ahead, Doctor Nina. Well, I know you're gonna t you're gonna tell us about the program where they have you know people with varying kinds of disabilities, movement disabilities, uh, go to those kind of horse things, right? Yes, I did that myself many years ago. But what I was going to say, um, the really, as I'm sure both of you are aware. Of, a bond really develops between a horse and their, their owner. I mean, we did the podcast on the Chincoting ponies a while back, and we told the story of Yakadiak and his myriad adventures. <laughs> but it just, it, it amazes me what these animals are capable of. Most people know about the positive impact bees have as a crucial component to a healthy environment. But most people aren't aware, I must admit, I was not aware until I read this, just how highly intelligent they are. They're self-aware, they're sentient, and they even have a primitive form of consciousness, some believe. They solve problems and are able to reason and think. Bees may even have a primitive form of subjective experiences. A bee intelligence researcher named Stephen Bachman told the UK Guardian newspaper. You know, it, it, it is really true. And I, I just I have to slip another thing in here, a little historical thing. When Europeans came to America, they brought diseases. One of the most deadly for Native Americans was smallpox. Mm -hmm. The reason that the Europeans smallpox wasn't as deadly to them was they had cows. What difference does that make? Well, cows will transmit cowpox to people. All right. Now, the vaccination for smallpox is still predicated on giving people cowpox. You know, you when you get that injection, that vaccination, you'll see a little pock mark. You can tell if somebody was born in the 50s and 60s because you'll see the little pock mark on their, usually their left shoulder. And it gives you immunity to smallpox. 
So cows and other animals too, some of the things that they give us, we don't see as, as, as much as, you know, they just, it just, they give it to you. And there's a lot of other animals that are really, really very intelligent, like deer. Now, deer, just as an, another aside, do you know that deer are more deadly to human beings than wolves? I didn't know that. And yeah, it's true. Just as an example, uh, and I was talking with Dr. Damien about this just the other day, how many uh, wolf attacks where there's a death for a human happen in the United States on a yearly basis? It's like less than one. Wow. I remember I thought it was in, in the three-digit range. Yeah, not so. That's truly amazing. Yeah. And other animals like llamas, koalas, um, squirrels. Okay. Now, how do we know that squirrels are, are intelligent? Well, they are aware. If you're watching a squirrel and you think you see them bury their, their nuts or whatever they've gathered, it's probably not accurate because if a squirrel sees that they're being watched, they will take the, the whatever they had in their cheeks and they will put them kind of in a little spot under their, um, under their arms, their, their front legs, mm -hmm. and they'll pretend to bury something in a spot where you can see them. They only bury the stuff when they think nobody's watching. <laughs> <laughs> now, orangutans, we know they're intelligent. Gorillas. Now, there's a very famous gorilla called Coco. Now, Coco had the ability to make 1,000 hand symbols, like people, deaf symbols, mm -hmm. you know, and could understand uh, 2,000 plus words. I mean, accurately understand them. Fascinating. Uh, other animals that you might not think of, hyenas, raccoons. Raccoons are very, very clever little creatures. Um, giraffes. And here's one that's bound to surprise people. Portia spiders. You could check that out. It, there's a lot of information there. When I was in uh, South Africa, there's a very special kind of antelope called a springbok. They have extra horns and they're sort of a national symbol similar to the way the bald eagle is in this country. And so help me God, on the streets of Johannesburg, there were people leading those animals on a leash the way you would a dog. Wow. And, and they can be tamed. And some of them are even uh, guards on some of these big ranches in the interior. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Animals are much smarter than we give them credit for being. You got that one right. Well, look, I hope you have enjoyed this little dive into the animal world. It was a pleasure to have Ms. Tannehill with us and for her to bring some of her expertise uh, out and share that with people. You know, we found it once again. There's more here than, than we thought. But we do hope that you will give us a, a like and that you will subscribe. And most importantly, that you'll come back and join us again soon. I hope we get to another, do another thing on uh, animals and pets uh, in general, because I think it's really fascinating and there's so much information out there. I agree. All right. Well, bye for now. And uh, once again, uh, thanks to Ms. Tannehill for joining us. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. So long, friends. Have a good day.